Hello everyone, today we talk about the kingdoms of Bohemia and of Hungary during the 14th and 15th centuries. We have made already uh, some videos about them in, in the immediately previous um, centuries and uh, we have already addressed in, in those videos how essentially there was a, an important contact and uh, especially in, in the late Middle Ages, even a community between uh, these powers that had actually different stories, right? We have usually dealt with them also to, together with Poland. We will see also today with the uh, Jagiellonian, um, you know, dynastic collection of crowns in, in the 15th century unfolded, but we have mostly highlighted the common characteristics of these kingdoms, such as, for example, the elective monarchies in late medieval times. Um, and also a general um, similarity, not just with the you know the, the internal levels of population, of um, distribution, for example, of urban development, of nobiliar presence, but also at a higher level, their international role. The fact that these were uh, kind of ethnic monarchies, respectively ruled um, Bohemia by the the Premislids, Hungary by by the Arpads, that as an important part of Central European lands at this point came to be ruled by uh, dynasts that were coming from the West, right? And it is the case for Bohemia with, with, with the Luxembourgs, um, famously, um, and for Hungary, the, the Angevins. And this is an important um, aspect, uh, institutionally speaking, because it shows the mm, somewhat the capability of these kingdoms to provide a sort of a, a cohesion um, still on, um, on an ethnic base that was capable of you know choosing who was uh, at power and fundamentally negotiating the, the you know the, the administration of the kingdom in a way and these were entities that albeit uh, initially um, newer right so less structured than the post Carolingian um, kingdoms in, in, in the West um, actually managed to maintain a degree of, of, of unity, of uh, continuity with their original ethnic core lands and to remain fundamentally at the base of, of the modern nations uh, even in after those you know, phenomena, like especially in the case of Hungary that so their the structuration, you know, think about the the Habsburging and Ottoman rule or Poland during the partitions in the 18th century, uh, Bohemia remaining actually within the frame of the Holy Roman Empire with its mm, specific electoral uh, role and even under Habsburgic domination, like its fundamentals were, were, were not altered uh, significantly. Um, but um, I think it's, it's very fascinating and what happens in these last two centuries of the Middle Ages is the mm, you know the, the commonality that is developed among these Central European monarchies in the attempt of the uh, respective sovereigns to develop a sort of supranational domination, since the prerogatives of the local abilities were very often very difficult to modify for the centralization uh, on a local base. Naturally, this was a weakness from one side, but it also, you know, it, it stimulated the enhancement of, you know, uh, this broader management on, on a larger scale within the same kingdoms and also uh, beyond them. And it's actually a very complicated uh, history that we will uh, have to address uh, in, in detail. At some point, uh, you you don't can't pretend to sum up 200 years of, you know, massive areas of Central European history in, you know, like a five minutes videos like some, some people like to do for the sake of, I don't know, clickbaiting for dumb people, I don't know what. Um, but um, the today we will address the, the story very loosely and looking rather at certain key figures, um, monarchs, uh, fundamentally of these, of these three alms. Um, so, as we were saying, the 14th to 15th century history of Bohemian Hungary was characterized by similar political dynamics, right? Uh, the extinction of those autochthonous dynasties that had uh, reigned up to that point in the two 
regions, as we have say, seen the Premislids in Bohemia and the Arpads in, in Hungary, uh, were extinguished at the beginning of the 14th century. And, and the uh, respective crowns ended under the control of princely houses coming from the Western European areas. And after a brief presence of the Habsburgs um, um, between 1306 and 1310, on the Bohemian throne were installed the Luxembourgs, right? The dynasty that controlled the also the Holy Roman Imperial Crown from 1346 and 1438. This is a very important time in Bohemian history as fundamentally um, the Luxembourgs ruled quite effectively from the local lands um, in this often, in fact, anti Habsburgic uh, policy. Uh, let's remember that throughout this time the, the Habsburgs had uh, fundamentally installed themselves in Austria after the extinction of the Babenberg dynasty and his had produced um, um, you know, uh, an enormous imbalance in the, in the Holy Roman Imperial lands because the Habsburgs now were fundamentally the most powerful uh, dynasty after the crashing of the same premises, right, that lived on but had lost the, basically all the um, imposant um, amount of territories that they had conquered in previous um, in pre previous decades, arriving stretching up to the Adriatic Sea, and having seized Austria itself, actually. So the Habsburgs, from from one time, were projected very strongly towards the east and the north from from Austria, and they even tried to to, to seize, uh, for example, Kutnahora, the, the mines of the Bohemian Crown, um, and to to, to 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 erode, in fact, the power of uh, the Bohemian uh, autonomy, um, and the Luxembourg dynasty in Bohemia began uh, with um, with John of Bohemia, right? That was, uh, in fact, John of Luxembourg, that was son of the uh, Holy Roman Emperor Henry VII. He was a very important figure. He was essentially the one that uh, tried to restore the uh, Germanic rule uh, in Italy after the uh, defeat of the Hohenstaufen, uh, the Habsburgs had minimally tried to do this. They had cleverly concentrated in a more uh, private asset, you know, construction. Not that the Luxembourgs actually were, you know, um, such this uh, chimera's followers, right? But they actually Henry the Seventh in Italy managed to, to compact at least the wall, Po Valley or almost all of it under the Ghibelline rule, while normally the, the, the area was being gradually hegemonized by the Angevins. And it brought to a, a great series of changes that actually triggered the same later Bohemian intervention in, uh, in the Po Valley itself, right? Because both John of Bohemia and his son Charles, the future Charles IV, actually uh, entered uh, Italy with this, um, you know, very different aim, actually, from the, the one for the, he, that they're uh, ancestor had uh, done because that already at, uh, at his time seemed to be uh, kind of illusory but at least trying to to exploit the, f the divisions as we will see now among the same Italians to, to, to carve out something actually you know it was mostly Italians calling them to <laughs> and funding them to um, to obtain something I in return in the first place and there were some uh, ephemeral um, you know, initiatives, especially the one of, of, of John uh, of Bohemia. Um, and um, John was, so the Luxembourg dynasty lasted uh, up to 1437, right, and had this very important uh, figures. John of Luxembourg uh, is, is a kind of a, you know, a romantic figure, to, to say the least. It was a kind of a knight king, right? He was more interested in going around Europe, uh, fighting on the very different battlefields, whether it's uh, Lithuania, Italy, France, right, and, um, <laughs> and not staying much in Bohemia itself. Um, and he, as we've seen, he was son of Henry VII and Margaret of Brabant, and he rose to the throne of Bohemia in 1310, right, uh, after uh, he married the uh, last of the Premislids, Elizabeth. Um, and John extended during 1312, uh, 22 and uh, 1329, the Bohemian dominions up to Eger and Slesian, um, and his attempts of expansion in the east uh, 
you know, triggered this contrast with Poland, uh, with which he uh, achieved an agreement in 1335, uh, through which he basically renounced the Polish crown, um, as much as, you know, a Kazimierz of Silesia uh, would do, uh, th that was the compromise uh, with his rival. And the, uh, the concept here, the, the Poland, today we talk about Bohemian Hungary, but you have to think that here Poland is the major player in the in the picture we have discussed it also in, in, in other videos but it's essentially this lar m actually much larger dominion especially compared to Bohemia this was was always close to it like the Poles had tried back in the day also to extend their their aims of, uh, of, of the same Bohemia the same Bohemians came to rule at some point uh, cities like Krakow right it would become even the, the Polish capital um, and uh, Bohemia is kind of geographically you know outlined by by the reliefs it's it's kind of a uh, objectively a space on its own and but it's more compact uh, Poland was much larger but in this sense it, it, it the PS dynasty couldn't hold it for, for long right so they, there were all these different duchies that fought against each other continuously and it's not even in fact up to the 14th century that this system begins to have a you know greater uh, union in, in the first place um, and uh, there was always this attempt to uh, to to obtain the same Polish crown from the uh, crown from the side of these powers. Even the Habsburgs had tried that originally, and and sometimes this side. I think the Habsburgs even achieved that. I, I I wouldn't like to say so. I think Halbert of Habsburg, son of Rudolf, uh, even achieved a Polish crown at some point. But it could could be easily wrong. But at least th this formalities were, were normal actually, which doesn't mean that they actually controlled Poland, but that they you know th these crowns were politicized, monetized, whatever you want to call it, as nominal possessions. And um, in, in, in here, with the establishment of the Luxembourgs in Bohemia, there is, there is this resizing also of the same Luxembourgic power and the attempt here to interfere also with Poland. That uh, at this time, by the way, uh, as you remember, is um, also mm, uh, this... Let's say for in, in, in the north of it, at least there is this frontier Baltic land where lots of European princes from literally all over Europe, especially Central Europe, participate on a regular base, right? The same Königsberg had been founded by a Bohemian king, right? So Ottokar II that had went there uh, in, during the Crusades. It was normal at the time, right? What do you do as a Central European monarch? I don't know. I go campaigning a little bit in the Baltic and it was a a way to extend your networks of you know of contact clientele and it was also it was a, a very strong chivalric ethics here there is also blurring here with 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 you know the borders of germany proper right the idea that also these lands had been gradually in the previous centuries fully uh westernized in their let's say frankish um you know military western military model that now had taken over also as a feudal political military culture um, and as we've seen, the same Luxembourgs were French um, themselves. So John uh, began also his Italian adventure because he was called by this, the, the northern city of, of Brescia to um, to defend himself, uh, f uh, to, to defend the city from the aims of uh, the della Scala uh, signory in 1330. That was swallowing all the cities around. And this was just an excuse, like it was a very small, m modest campaign that was funded largely by those Italian cities that were uh, at that point trying to uh, survive this um, radical land grabbing from the side, chiefly of the De La Scala, of Verona and the Visconti of Milan, they were building m very sound territorial um, uh, dominions, uh, dominations in the Po Valley. Um, and f from it's the picture is very complicated, but let's say that if for these reasons, John managed to extend progressively his protection over cities like Mantua, Cremona, Parma, uh, Reggio, and Modena, right? And he even sent um, troops in uh, Lucca, Tuscany, the, uh, as the city was being threatened by Florence, right? So, uh, trying fi filling the gaps of what was remaining out of the major. Uh, of the major signories uh, of that time, and but the, the, this whole thing failed because it didn't have a, a real plan. I mean, there wasn't a greater uh, strategic um, 
you know, intention in here. There was there was not an imperial expedition anymore, right? Like the one of Henry the Seventh had been a, a serious thing. This, um, um, you know, state of being came to an end when uh, the coalition of Ludwig of uh, Wittelsbach, of Pope John the Twenty Second, and Robert of Anjou, King of Naples. Uh, rendered ephemeral John's uh, uh, dominion, but it was not even because of these players that it was ephemeral, right? It was the, simply that, that the local cities had accepted his uh, protection, uh, but and which means that they paid him for maintaining certain, um, essentially, uh, heavily armored horsemen that he recruited from from the same place. Says. And um, and to defend them against this, and it, it's actually interesting because it was a way to to squeeze money actually from some of these cities, right? And uh, he probably cashed something out at the end of the day. Uh, we know it because if anything, this the cities were um, were looted fundamentally, and um, but also probably all the, all the wealth was seized what was spent uh, after for, for for John's policy. So. Um, and at the Diet of Rense in 1346, however, uh, against uh, Ludwig of Wittelsbach, John managed to have his son elected as king of the Romans, right? And we're talking about Charles, the, the future Charles IV, Holy Roman Emperor, who had also followed his father in Italy. He had fought uh, you know, against the, the papal, um, you know, uh, it, it's kind of strange. It was the fundamentally the Abitasbach and Papal and um, Angevin tr- coalition, his, um, and he, in in his father, I mean John, uh, eventually lost his sight in an expedition in Lithuania, uh, where he had gone to fight for the Teutonic Order in 1337, and he uh, died uh, at the Battle of Crecy, famously. Uh, while blind, you know, he kept fighting on, you know, uh, on the battlefield, <laughs> right to that, on the side of the, the king of France, and uh, this is kind of the, uh, this is the full Middle Ages, the full chivalric mindset that says, I don't give a damn, even if I'm a king, I'm blind, I don't stay in my castle, right, you know, um, enjoying the last days on earth, I will fight to to the death on a battlefield, right, that's that's exactly the, the, the political and military ethos existing at the time. Um, and and all these all of these rulers were fundamentally knights, right? It was their due. I mean, there was no other option, right? It was not a civilian king. It didn't exist as a concept. So the other crucial figure, as we have already seen, is Charles the Fourth of Luxembourg, right? Emperor proper, um, and actually. Uh, Charles the First as King of Bohemia, as you know, because he summed all of this dynastic uh, possessions. Um, he um, he was um, a son of, of of John, as we've seen, and of Elizabeth, who was the sister of Wenceslas the uh, Third, that had been King of Bohemia and Poland, right? The last uh, of the Premislid dynasty, right? The last male, I mean, the, the, the last ruler proper uh, of the Premislids. Um, and Charles had a very refined uh, education at the French court, right? Um, he married Blanche of Valois, and he was, he had been previously uh, imperial vicar in Italy in 1331. With his father then, he uh, passed uh, to Bohemia, where he had uh, being entrusted uh, the, the local with the local administration, and he multiple times, like in 1337, 1340, 1341, he had to defend his possessions in northeastern Italy, in the region of Venice and Friuli, and um, he mm, eventually supported France in his uh, clash against England, where you know where his father died. Uh, at Crecy, and where he hims- himself remained f- wounded uh, in the battle, interestingly enough. Um, and so at, at this point, that's when he succeeded to his father as King of Germany in 1346, and as King of Bohemia uh, the, the year later. Later on, in 1355, he was crowned em- Holy Roman Emperor in Rome 
right? But he had basically to come back to to Germany while uh, the Italians were re revealing uh, hostile to him all over uh, the places. Um, but eventually he came back to Italy in 1368. He tried in vain to uh, give uh, like a, a kind of a policy of balance in the local affairs, um, of pacifying also partially, but those were barely, you know, the times <laughs> which this thing could be achieved because it was literally continuous war, uh, systemically speaking. And disappointed, he came back definitely in it to, to Bohemia in 1369, where um, even among, um, I mean, you know, to, to which uh, even during his, all these wars he had participated to, had, he had dedicated still the major care, right? He, Charles really cared a lot about his Bohemian possessions, and he had entrusted... Uh, namely, but you know, because obviously was the, they were the most important ones as well. But he he had a pretty differently from his father. He had a pretty concrete and an effective way to cope with his dominions, and um, he had, for example, granted to Bohemia the ecclesiastical autonomy. It had extended its territories, right? Uh, for example, he had annexed um, the uh, the Br Brandenburg be the region, as you know, today Berlin at the time didn't count in basically anything as a city, but as a town, right? Um, and um, this was an important um, possession that Bohemia maintained for, for a long time. Um, then, uh, famously, probably one of his greatest achievements in, within the um, you know institutional policy of the Holy Roman Empire, he had emanated the Golden Bull in 1356, uh, granting the sovereignty of the Bohemian kingdom by uh, granting to the Bohemian monarchs the right of vote in the election of the emperors. Actually, this had already, you know, uh, taken place over uh, along the you know the, the political ratios of strength of the time because Bohemia was a quite consistently uh, compact and solid and important power, right, in the mid in the second half of the 13th century, objectively Bohemia was the, the strongest power um, in, at least in Central Europe and in the Empire north of the Alps no single German power before the Battle of Markford could, could match it essentially um, and, um, but this was a way to essentially institutionalize the so-called electors of which Bohemia represented the uh, one of the, the four secular ones, right um, and um, also Charles elevated greatly the tone of the cultural and economic life of the country, right? He founded in Prague in 1348 the first university of Central Europe, right? This is very, very important. I made a video that I think is rightly uh, titled uh, Bohemian, the, the heart of 14th century Europe, because it objectively was, right? It was one of the greatest cultural centers a great um uh, it was at, at literally at the center of the world international pause right the the emperors the holy roman emperors ruled from from prague the uh the, the cultural the, the economical activities were, were f flowering um, in, in the country um, and it was also one of the few powers in in the air in the region that could give a certain stability fundamentally to, to, to the situation um, there would be a lot to discuss about this there are also sheer logistical reasons. It's well placed at the, the, the proper center of Europe, uh, also geographically speaking. Um, and um, also, Charles himself was actually a, a, a patron of the arts, right? And uh, you look at these great uh, politicians and military men, and you realize they were also very refined people, after all. Um, Charles um, would die after having ensured to his son Wenceslas the German crown. Um, so, passing temporarily, let, let's bit make a bit big back and forth in here to the Hungarian side, right? So, in 1308, it's, it's the Angevins, as we have seen, that rise to the Hungarian throne, right? And they would maintain the power locally up to 1307. Um, such as Poland and Bohemia, 
Also, Hungary went through this period of um, strong political interpreting reality, we could say, and of remarkable mm, cultural flowering, especially in the second half of, of the 14th century, right? Definitely the greatest king is remembered, in fact, as the great as Louis I, ruling between 1342 and 1382. That was, uh, e even in here, uh, an immense uh, figure for the, um, also for, for the territorial expansion, but also for the, the cultural life. He, in fact, founded the University of Pax in 1367. Right. Consider always at this point the importance of universities as a the, the cradle essentially of a skilled bureaucratic personnel. Right. These are lay center lay centers of studies, and they're founded um, for uh, for allowing essentially the, the, the this growing monarchies to to centralize with with a, an eff effective administration uh, and um, skilled clerics. Right. Uh, this the 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 institutional uh, body of the kingdom, and Louis also widened the Hungarian borders towards the Adriatic Sea and the Bosnian area. Um, Louis was a son of um, Charles Robert of Anjou and of Elizabeth, that was the daughter of the uh, Polish king Ladislas. And Louis inherited uh, from his father the uh, Hungarian crown, as we've seen in 1342, and, interestingly enough, from his uh, uncle, Kazimir III, uh, the one of Poland, in 1370. So, he dynastically united the two kingdoms, right? So, that the, the Anjou, at this point, are really a... a, a a very high level of power, right? That there is actually a split that is taking place, as we will see now, between all the, the various branches of the Anjou, right? As Naples is starting to do something on its own, Hungary too. Um, but there is this attempt to reconnect the whole thing. And here the Angevins stretch from uh, southern France, southern Italy, um, the parts of, of, of Greece and, 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 and Hungary and Poland. So this is really a big uh, system, right? Um, and, um, and, and what is fascinating in general, I if you look at it in perspective, is the beginning in from the end of the 13th to the beginning of the 14th century, this, this shift of um, f French and also partly German dynasties to towards the west, the, the, the east, right? especially um, the Luxembourgs and the, the Angevins are the, the brightest examples of this. And this uh, Possibility, right, to fundamentally escape the uh, the mess of the you know feudal um, intertwining that had taken place in Western Europe, where it was very very difficult to make an headway, right, to reorganize something from you know, in a, cent on a centralized base. And looking at these kingdoms, that in spite the were they had kind of weaker central institutions, at least they were more unitary, paradoxically, because they hadn't known. Um, uh, that uh, wild uh, and aggressive process of feudalization, feud f almost a feudal anarchy that had, um, you know, built this private, massive private domains. I mean, they existed, but they were somewhat easier to, they, they were smaller than, than the, the ones in the West, and they were kind of, there was still, let's say, a compactness in these domains, a certain, you know, rational um, uh, regrouping of them that could af make them afford to to rule it uh, with naturally, as we've seen, the adequate political negotiations with the nobility, but trying to to build in there something m paradoxically more centralized. And at this point, Hungary is a hell of a power, right? Hungary, as we often said at this point from the Pannonian Basin, had extended its control I in a kind of an imperialistic sense all over the, uh, the surrounding territories. Um, the sum of titles of the Hungarian king was... was endless right <laughs> you know and it was also a natural matter of propaganda but l literally the um the, the 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 foundation of the hungarian kingdom back in the day had started from essentially a, a, a central asian model right uh, let's be honest about this the idea there is a center of a militarized aristocracy that uh, rules all around right with this deterrent force that is able to stretch here back and forth for example the 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 construction of bohemia was Fairly different, at least in scale. Uh, also, the one of Poland hadn't begun like that. 
Hungary had maintained this kind of more markedly imperialistic character, right? And and uh, at this point, it was really a, a power to be reckoned with. Up to the Ottoman uh, conquest, it was uh, an immense domain. It was one of the largest powers in Europe, for, for sure. It's not given uh, enough credit, I, I would say, um, for it. Um, so Louis, in 1346, having the, pre the pretext of uh, the assassination of his brother Andrew, that was husband to the uh, Queen uh, Johann uh, I, uh, he invaded and conquered the Kingdom of Naples. Right? It was a very swift move. Um, he passed really unopposed, and he he got it. But the Pope Clements the the the, the sixth didn't at all like what was going on because now Hungary plus Naples combined were a hell of a power, and um, papal policy had always been at, at that point like to essentially. Uh, first of all, to create a, a seigneury on its own in northern Italy, um, with in the previous decades that had failed actually, uh, with Bertrand de Pouget. Um and and now it was also a moment of crisis. Here there had been the the plague. I mean, it, it was the, the the world was you know cr creaking right in some ways, and he decided at least not to. Um, to to recognize his investiture to king, right? So Louis actually came back a second time uh, to Italy in 1350, but because of the plague at this point and also the great distance from his kingdom, right? He uh, was finally obliged to actually accept um, a money indemnity from the Pope and to retreat his own troops. Uh, Louis then turned to this other historical rival of Hungary, that is Venice. Right? In this war that lasted from 1356 and 58, uh, there had always been a kind of ongoing warfare. Think about the in Venetian capture of uh, the Hungarian Tsar in, in, uh, in f during the Fourth Crusade, and always this you know, inherent problem of the uh, Central European powers. There was to, they needed to have a they largely didn't have a, an access to the sea, right? So Hungary actually being uh, closer uh, to it was, was tempting, especially in the Adriatic, that was one of uh, definitely more, you know, at least infrastructurally served than the Black Sea and a very important um, starting point for to in even intervening in the Italian policies. It was, uh, there were at this point some of the most interesting, as we have seen also for the Luxembourgs. Um, and... Um, and he managed to seize uh, Dalmatia from Venice, right? And he um, was, um, which was confirmed actually as a territorial acquisition by the Peace of Turin in 1381. Uh, in the Balkans, things got uh, fundamentally worse, right? Uh, s since um, Louis' expedition in uh, Wallachia and in Moldavia were um, not such a great um, achievement and um, also um, he had to give help to his uncle Kazimir, king of Poland as against the Bohemians the Lithuanians uh, the Tatars um, and, and yet this actually mm, won to Louis uh, further titles for the succession on, on the Polish throne at the death of Kazimir the pact of succession um, uh, ensured to him by the father, brought Louis on the throne of Krakow, in fact, in 1370. And the person, personal union of the two kingdoms um, gave, um, you know, place to difficulties, right, fundamentally. And Louis wasn't particularly favorable to the Poles, who, at his death, accepted his um, daughter, Edvige, as, as a queen, uh, but with the, uh, the condition that she would reside in Poland, right? Uh, this was a big deal, because when you get a, a supernational uh, domination, naturally, uh, there is a, uh, you're not suspended in a vacuum and ruling from the above, right? There is always a, uh, one of, 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 the, of these possessions that are kind of the center point, and even for, for the Anjou, that was, was Hungary. Um, and... Um, and in internally, I mean, do domestic policy, Louis, uh, you know, governed by summoning rarely 
died, he confirmed in 1351 the Golden Bull of Andrew II um, and declared inalienable uh, the uh, hereditary nobiliary goods, right? Uh, Hungary had very, very important um, um, nobiliar lineages that had uh, acquired a sort of magnate-like um, status in several, I mean, in this large area of the Danubian uh, plains um, that were kind of of seigneuries within 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 the kingdom, right? So coming back to Bohemia. Uh, with the sons of Charles IV, that is Wenceslas 1378-1419 and Sigismund 1419-1437, uh, the Luxembourg monarchy uh, uh, ceased, uh, right, and uh, it was followed by uh, 20 years of Habsburgic domination. So, these two kings, last two Luxembourg kings, are, are fascinating. Um, Wenceslas IV, at King of Bohemia and of Germany, um, he um, was a key figure in this uh, context of the development of the Hasid movement, right? And he had the Chancellor of the Archbishop Prague assassinated, and causing in 1394 the civil war that lasted up to 1404. He also clashed in 1402 with his brother Sigismund, and uh, eventually. Uh, gave to him the imperial title inherited by the father. Um, Wenceslas was was the third born of Charles the Fourth, that had procured to him uh, the, as we have seen, the uh, in 1376 the crown of Germany, and in 1378 he said uh, leave to him the the legacy of the imperial legacy of the Luxembourgs, right, um, and. In order to understand here how the also the, these institutions are declining, Wenceslas never managed to be recognized by everybody as an emperor, nor to be crowned in Rome. Right? Um, in Hungary, he had to intervene personally with an army in order to um, uh, ensure the crown to his brother Sigismund in 1386. In Germany, he acted somewhat like, mm, let's say, swinging between the you know the the, the contrasts between the, the princes and the cities, right? And also in Bohemia, his uh, policy, as we've seen, provoked this, you know, malaise. Uh, a chance for the revolt of the nobility was represented with this conflict with the, the Archbishop of Prague, as we have we have said before, John of uh, Jenstein, I say, I presume it is, pronounced... Um, that uh, managed to um, to actually uh, break uh, the attempt of the king to create a diocese to diminish the powers of the archbishop and the reaction of the king that uh, brought to torture and to to drone uh, John of uh, Pomuk, who was counselor of the archbishop, led to this uh, revolt of the nobility that managed to to imprison the same. Uh, Wenceslas in 1394 and, and freed thanks to the mediation of his brother Sigismund his diminished prestige brought him to the uh, deposition from the same empire 1400 in favor of Rupert the Count Palatine um, and therefore in Bohemia a new civil war broke out Wenceslas was imprisoned uh, again by his brother Sigismund at Vienne uh, in uh, 1402 where um, from which he escaped for a year, uh, a year and a half later, right? And he didn't manage to reacquire the imperial title that he had to to give to his brother uh, Sigismund finally in 1410, also because he was hit by a paralysis, and his inaction in the last years also contributed to the development, uh, the further development of the Hussite movement, and Wenceslas uh, died uh, during a revolt an anti hussite revolt in uh, the hand broke out in Prague. So Sigismund was son, as we've seen, of Charles IV and of Elizabeth of Pomerania, brother uh, of Wenceslas IV as well, and last emperor of the House of Luxembourg. He um, engaged uh, with Mary of Anjou in 1380, 
uh, she was the daughter of Louis the Great of Hungary, and um, this s seemed to grant him the succession to in in Hungary and in Poland as well, right? But only in in Bo in Hungary, he, uh, Sigismund actually managed to affirm himself after his marriage in 1385. Um, Sigismund intervened in the continuous struggles against the, the Ottomans that at this point were, were expanding uh, in, in the Balkans and he uh, suffered uh, in 1396 the, the, this very high uh, you know, the defeat of uh, the Battle of Nicopolis where you know, the, the great commitment from most Central European powers had, this, had been channeled um, and uh, uh, even you know the the most of Europeans were and would for a very long time actually underestimate the Ottoman the Ottoman threat. These monarchies, especially Hungary, that were essentially almost next door to to the territories that the Ottomans were were, were conquering, were naturally waking up uh, earlier, and whatever was happening there had a, a more direct impact on, on them. And at the death of Rupert of Palatinate, he mm, proposed his candidacy to King of the Romans, and he was designed by a part of the elector princes um, as, as such. The other, um, the other part chose instead Josh of Moravia. And he uh, eventually obtained the crown after the death of his rival in 1411. Sigismund uh, was immediately committed in providing a solution to the Western schism. Now it was um, uh, creating problems uh, also in his Bohemi Bohemian lands, uh, that where the situation had been fundamentally unstable. And therefore, he convinced the anti-pope John the Twenty-Third to com to summon a council at Constance in 1414. And uh, for this, also he was a you know decisive and convinced supporter of the reform of the church. And his attitude towards Jan Hus, uh, that was uh, invited by his own initiative to defend his own thesis to the council, um, where he was eventually uh, put on trial to to be eventually uh, burned at the stake as an heretic didn't favor Sigismund politically and at the death of Venceslas the Fort of Bohemia in 1419 he had now to deal this uh, long revolt of the Hussites in Bohemia before uh, being recognized um, here uh, as a king in 1436 and in the period during the, the harsh campaigns against the Hussites, Sigismund had never, however, renounced to his program of uh, ecclesiastical reform. And um, he mm, had essentially the, the councils of, of Basel uh, summoned in 1431, at least by his own initiative. And um, he was convinced of the opportunity to seize the imperial crown in order to exercise a, a more effective influence of, on, on, his, uh, on, on the council. Uh, he came to Italy in 1431 and in Milan he was crowned as King of Italy and eventually in Rome in 1433 he was crowned Emperor by the Pope Eugene the Fort. Uh, Sigismund died while Bohemia was preparing a new insurrection against him. For what concerns the relations with Poland and Germany, uh, the situation I is, uh, you know, a bit uh, complicated. He adopted a, a, a essentially a containment policy, right? Uh, he uh, he was very mindful of the Polish threat, especially after the Battle of Tannenberg in 1410, uh, when Poland and Lithuania had defeated the Teutonic Order. Um, and he uh, essentially decided to grant uh, the Mark of Brandenburg, that as we have seen had been acquired by Bohemia back in the day, uh, uh, with uh, the attached electoral dignity, because the, the Mark of Brandenburg was an, an, another of the four secular electors together with the Bohemian king, to the Hohenzollern in 1417, um, and uh, also um, the uh, 
um, the, the, the electorate of Saxony Wittenberg to Frederick, the quarrelsome of the house of Betten. Um, so he basically ceded uh, this uh, northern territories uh, because of the, you know, trying to balance out, not bearing the, the onslaught of, of, of his enemies uh, all at once, as far as I understand. Also in Schwerpunkt we haven't dealt uh, still with the Hussite revolt, the theme of the Czech Reformation. But let's say uh, after the, those 20 years of um, Habsburgic domination between 1458 and, and, and 1479 was restored uh, a national monarchy of, in Bohemia, right, with the Hussite king, George uh, Podebrad. He was elected uh, Bohemian king uh, at the death of Ladislas Posthumus, thanks to the backing of the Utraquists of Jan Roki uh, Zana. And he um, tried to subtract Bohemia and, um, and, to, and with it Europe to the political religious subjection of the papacy and of the empire. He was excommunicated for this reason by Paul II in 1466. Uh, he had also to uh, cope with his son-in-law Matthias Corvinus that we'll discuss in a while um, that had been posed by the Pope at the head of the crusade that was launched against him, right? Um, this is v George of Podebrad is a very fascinating figure. He also theorized this greater fort um, of Christianity towards towards the, the Ottoman expansion rather than, you know, among St. Christians, but there were very important political and religious, uh, I mean, ecclesiastical interests behind uh, this all. Um, George of Podebrady lost Moriah yeah, in, in this point, but he managed to exist in Bohemia, where he, he, eventually, he eventually died. Uh, in the 50 years later, between 1471 and 1526, the crown instead fell again in the hands of a, uh, of a foreign dynasty, right? The one of the Jagiellonians that reigned, as we've seen also on the, now, the, the Polish and Lithuanian uh, state. Um, and um, in analogy with what we have seen for Bohemia, the Hungarian throne, after having passed from the Anjou to uh, Sigismund of Luxembourg, um, ended up to be ruled by a local family, the Huniadi, very famously of Romanian ancestry. Uh, think about John Huniadi, I mean, this was one of the most famous families at the time. Uh, John mastered his military skills on the southern borderlands of the Kingdom of Hungary. They were exposed uh, to Ottoman attacks. He was appointed as voivode of Transylvania and head of a number of southern counties and assumed responsibility for these fence of uh, of the of the frontiers in in 1441, uh, uh, really um, a key figure. But today we concentrate rather on his son Matthias the um, first Corvinus as king uh, of Hungary, and um, uh, Matthias ruled between 1458-1490. He um, had this great uh, he gave this great impulse uh, to a, a strong widening of the kingdom. As we have seen, subtracting Moravia uh, actually from uh, to to the Bohemian monarchy, um, and uh, he he's a really great figure. Going a bit more in detail, uh, Matthias Corvinus was elected at the death of Ladislas V to the Hungarian throne in 1458, while he was still prisoner in Prague of King George of Podebrad. When he came back to Hungary, he had to fight for a long time to firm his own sovereign power against the aristocracy, right? That backed at the time the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick III, um, and uh, also against the Hussites, right? That were um, essentially uh, entrenched in uh, Upper Hungary, and gotten rid of the domestic warriors, he. Uh, began to direct his uh, force in repelling the Ottomans from the southern provinces of his kingdom. 
after having defeated them, he penetrated in Bosnia. Uh, he seized the fortress of Jajice in uh, December 1463. And in 1464, uh, with the support of Pope Pius II, he planned this great crusade against Mehmet II. Um, uh, consider here, Constantinople has already uh, fallen, the Turks are swarming the Balkans, right? So here Hungary is literally the, now the, the first country on, on the frontier. Eventually Matthias was involved um, in the war uh, against the Hussites of, and, and against George of Podebrad in 1468. Um, this was the result of the promise that was uh, made him by uh, Frederick III and Pope Paul II to the succession to the imperial throne, right? Uh, for this reason, Matthias entered Moravia, um, and uh, he was elected on May the 3rd, 1469, by the Bohemian Catholics as King of Bohemia. Um, and uh, in, a, in a short while, he had to fight also against the, the Poles, after that George of Podebrady had uh, designed, uh, appointed to as his successor. Uh, Ladislas was the son of Kazimir the, the fort of Poland um, and as uh, in in this complicated picture basically Austria Bohemia Poland Wallachia were uh, in a coalition against Hungary and Matthias um, uh, managed to block superior enemy forces around Breslau where he saved uh, his um, kingdom from um, the enemy invasion and with the peace of Olomouc in 1478, uh, he managed to maintain also the occupied Bohemian territories. Uh, aspiring to the imperial crown, Matthias now turned uh, to the against the Habsburgs, uh, and in four campaigns between 1477 and 1485, he uh, managed to uh, seize um, Lower Austria and uh, Styria, uh, managing even to enter Vienna. Right, but this such uh, incredible power uh, now began to worry the uh, electors of the empire, who chose um, on the imperial throne uh, the son of Frederick the Third, Maximilian, for in 1486. Um, and Matthias, always with the purpose to lead this great campaign against the Turks, that was the underlying, you know, uh, ideal of, of of the times, and uh, a major uh, necessity for the Hungarian kingdom uh, in, in particular, um, uh, from a strategical point of view, he grew closer to the Habsburgs. Right, uh, albeit uh, death in 1490 put an end to his uh, plans. Um, and Matthias Corvinus is, is, is an enormous figure, right? Uh, he was a soldier, an administrator, a lawmaker. Uh, he was cultivated, uh, a patron, uh, a messin, a true messinist. Um, and he was definitely one of the most fascinating figures, we can say, of the Renaissance uh, by certain standard. He attracted in Buddha um, humanists, artists. He founded the great Corvinian library. Um, where he collected this um, many uh, expensive um, uh, manuscripts that were part uh, made by Italian copists, in part produced in, in a, in also in a um, scriptorium that wasn't next to the library. Uh, under Matthias' reign um, was founded in Buddha the first typography. Right and uh, very intense were the relations with Italy, um, also thanks to the um, the marriage with uh, Beatrice, uh, daughter of Ferdinand of Aragon and King of Naples. Consider at this point also for military reasons there is, and we will see this uh, in, in a dedicated video, all the uh, enormous amount of imports in areas like Hungary or Romania during the wars against the Turks of. Um, oh, Italian military technology, I mean, literally, uh, Milanese armor, artillery coming from this, um, you know, in this through, through this line west east um, in, uh, in, in the Hungarian uh, markets. Uh. And um, in 1490, at the death of Matthias, finally, Hungary and Bohemia were united in a great supranational monarchy, um, 
thanks to the work of Ladislas the the seventh um, Iagello, that uh, reigned on both of these regions. Ladislas um, uh, was a son of the King of Poland, Casimir I, and of Elizabeth of Habsburg. When George of Podebrady died, he was elected king in Bohemia in 1471, and he was a competitor with Matthias Corbinus, that, as we've seen, had been elected by a minority. And after two unfortunate expeditions against Matthias in 1479, um, the, the Hungarian king and, uh, and Ladislas uh, signed a peace by uh, maintaining both the title of uh, King of Bohemia, though. Um, and when Matthias died, uh, Ladislas was finally proclaimed as king of Hungary, but he was fundamentally n not particularly energic. He was uh, somewhat t tolerant towards the various political and religious tensions of, of Bohemia. Um, so, Bohemia and Hungary kept having a common destiny also in the modern age when they found this common, let's say, Habsburgic and Ottoman uh, threat, right, ending up to be absorbed in, in a different way from by the, the two powers. Um, in fact, uh, starting from the third a decade of the 16th century, the disappearance of the Jagiellonian monarchy um, um, because of the uh, defeat suffered against the Turks at the Battle of Moax in 1526 uh, brought to the split of Hungary between the, uh, in fact, the Ottomans and the Habsburgs, while Bohemia fell mm, uh, unavoidably uh, by a certain standard in the political sphere of the uh, Im Austrian imperial house and was uh, 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 to remain essentially part of the Habsburgic domains so by, you know, with all the difficulties that we know of the case uh, look at the beginning of the Thirty Years War for example but aside from this um, yeah, this is more or less the picture and um, I think it's always very fascinating to look at the history of these countries um, leaving aside from the fact that in popular culture, I don't think we, we talk so much about them, but they had a, f a terrific history, um, an enormous beauty and cultural production and, and legacy, and uh, they, they, they definitely stand out as some of the most important uh, realms of uh, the, the Middle Ages. And uh, we will keep deepening, uh, hopefully in the future, their history, we usually do it more from a military point of view. Uh, a couple of months ago, we made that video about the Hungarian knights in the 13th century. Never done something specifically about mm, Bohemia from a military point of view. We'll have to repair to that in some way. Albeit, his, its military culture was essentially identical to the one of Germany, right? Uh, so that's also part of the reason why we don't distinguish it so much. But there were certain specific characters, um, especially in the previous centuries. Um, to 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 the texts that are that are very very interesting. We'll have to deal with them. All right. So for now, we stop it here, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time, and see you next time. Bye.